We are starting a new sermon series which we simply entitled Esther, God Behind the Scene. Uh, this would be the last series uh, that we will have before Christmas. And I'm actually very excited with the study. Um, and by the way, haven't you noticed that as a church, we have gone through several books of the Bible this year, right? We've gone through Proverbs, right? Uh, the Gospel of John. We read through uh, a big chunk of the book of Psalms. We read through the, uh, the life of Abraham from, in Genesis. And we're also looking at the book of Esther. Amen, right? That's good. Now, the book of Esther has 10 chapters, and so we're going to be spreading the readings in the next few weeks, and by the end of the series, you will have read through the book of chapter as well. So check out uh, the Bible reading guide at the Uvers- uh, on the YouVersion app as well, and uh, we're also going to be posting the, the readings on our FB page uh, later today. Now, uh, this morning, we're going to be covering uh, Esther's chapter 1 and 2. But for our scripture readings, we'll look at a few verses from Esther chapter 2. So once again, can I invite everybody to please rise up from uh, your seats as we read the Word of God. Let's read Esther chapter 2, verses 5 to 10, and then from verses 16 to 20. Can we read this together? Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, and son of Shimei, and son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiachin, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This girl, who was also known as Esther, was lovely in form and features, And Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many girls were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. The girl pleased him and won his favor, Immediately, he provided her with her beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven maids selected from the king's palace and moved her and her maids into the best place in the harem. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Let's jump to verse 16. She was taken to King Circes in the royal residence in the 10th month the month of, the, of Tibeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Now, king, now the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces, and distributed gifts with royal liberality. When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, but Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality, just as Mordecai had told her to do, for she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we we come before you and we worship you today. Thank you for um, allowing us to come today and to have the time to sing songs to you. You are in our midst. You are here with us. And Lord, we humble ourselves before you this morning. We ask that you will be the one to open our eyes and our hearts to your word today. May you speak to us, grant us understanding, that only your Holy Spirit can do. And all of this, Father, we give praise and glory and honor to you and to you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please take your seats. <clears throat> how, many, how many of you have ever watched a game where you already knew, you already knew who would win? 
Nah? There was this time, um, it was a Sunday after the service, we were having lunch at the restaurant, and it was one of those Pacquiao fights. And I actually forgot which one, but the place where we were eating, there was this large TV right beside our table, and they were showing the fight, but it was a delayed telecast. And so, you know, as we were watching Thrilling Kayang Game, you know, we were looking at the fights, and I was the only one who had data. So what I did was I actually checked online what the outcome of the fight was. And it, was, it turned out it was one of those fights that Pacquiao lost. And so, you know, the, the good guy that I was, I told everyone the outcome. Pindi mo si Pacquiao, ani. And you know what happened? Everybody was bombed out. Di na ani. Let's not watch this anymore. Now, how many of you have, you know, hate to be, to be given spoilers? Uh, how many of you hate spoilers? You know, whether it's about a game or the result of a, uh, the story of a movie or a book. Right? There are many who do not like spoilers. We want to be able to watch a, a movie or, or watch a game and read a book and go through the ups and downs of the story without knowing how it would end, right? But I think there are also some of those of you who would rather know the ending ahead of time. Anyway, what, what's, what am I driving at? I want to begin today's message by giving you a few tips on how to read the book of Esther. Okay, now first is this. Understand that the book of Esther was put after the events of the story. Okay, but by the way, we don't know who the writer is. But when, this, when Esther was written, or the book of Esther was written, the original readers of the story would have already known something about the historical facts of the book. So it's like watching a replay of the Pacquiao fight, but you already know the outcome. So, so think about that as you read the book of Esther. I'll explain it later as we go on. Now, secondly, as you read the book, I want you to note that the author in many instances refrained from making any moral or ethical evaluations of certain situations. He just gives us the facts. Now, I believe he does that intentionally so that you and I will not lose sight of the main point of the story. And so also, because of that, we must be careful not to interpret the text based on our, ideolo our ideological concepts or the way we see things, because there are many details that we do not know, okay? And thirdly, you need to read, this is the most important thing, you need to read the book within its historical context, which was Persia in the 5th century B.C., Okay? Now, the book introduces us to a community of Jewish people who were living in a city named Susa. Susa was the king's winter capital at that time. Now, it was in Susa that the scheme to kill all the Jewish people in the entire Persian Empire was hatched, but it was eventually overturned. That's basically the story of the book of Esther's. Now, in this particular period of time, the Jewish people had been exiled in Babylon. For 70 years, they had served a number of kings, beginning with Nebuchadnezzar. Cyrus the Great would later conquer Babylon somewhere in 539 B.C. And life changed for the Israelites when Cyrus came because he now allowed the Jewish people to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple. Uh, because, you know, God had already promised them that they would return after 70 years. And there were actually three batches of people who went back. They were led by Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel. However, here's the thing. The vast majority of the Jewish people chose to either remain in Babylon or to move further uh, east to Susa. Okay, and so Susa is where the story of Esther belongs to in this particular period in the history of the Israelites. And at this time, the ruling king was a guy named Ahasuerus or um, Xerxes I, who ruled from 485 to 465 B.C. And we actually know a lot about Xerxes because of the writings of Greek historians. For example, Herodotus in his book, Histories, would devote a third of his book to Xerxes' war with the Greeks. 
Okay, and we'll also talk about this along the way as we study uh, this, um, as we study Esther. So three things. Now, first, understand that the book was written after the events had already passed. Secondly, note the author deliberately does not comment on some issues. And then thirdly, read the book again. Read the book in its historical context. Now, there's a lot of reasons why we would benefit from a study of the book of Esther. And let me just mention a few of them. First, um, context tells us, again, as we mentioned a while ago, the Jews were living in Persia. They were a dispersed people. That means that they were a religious minority. They were living in a society which was dominated by moral and spiritual values that were very different from their own. And so if you think about it, how, how do you relate as a minority living in a dominant culture? What do you do? Do you withdraw so that you can remain completely pure? I think on a practical level, that's pr almost impossible, right? For example, think about today. Social media is a very dominant part of society today. Many of us complain that, you know, after scrolling through FB, we end up depressed. But, you know, do you totally withdraw from Facebook or, or from other social media platforms? In most instances, you really can't, right? Or on the other hand, think, think about this. Do you try to just fit in and, and keep your views private and secret? That doesn't seem quite completely right either, diva. Right? Or on the other hand, do you protest everything and complain and critique everything? Would you do that? I mean, oftentimes, when, if we actually do that all the time, we would come out as unkind and ungracious, and, and sometimes it results in bad testimony, right? Diva. So what do you do? We'll learn a lot from the book of Esther when it comes to that. Now, secondly, you will find that in this story is a woman who becomes a vehicle for justice in a very male-dominated society. And this is very interesting as well. So, that, so we're going to see this in the entire story of Esther. And thirdly, for anybody, whether you're, fame, you're a male or you're a female, the question is, how do you follow God in situations where you're kind of flying blind and you don't even know what's the right thing to do? Let me give you an example. We read about Esther being thrown into a kind of a Miss Persia pageant, right? The situation where the ultimate goal was one night with a king. I mean, how do you deal with that? Is that okay? Or is that not okay? Does God work in situations like that? How does God work in those kinds of situations, right? We'll find out as we study the book of Esther. Now, I give you a fair warning. For those of you who are used to the Sunday school version of Esther, you're going to be, okay, so just give you a fair warning, okay? Now, today, we're going to look at chapters 1 and 2. Now, we don't have time to, to read through the entire thing, and I would like to leave that for you to read during the coming week. That's what our Bible readings are for, okay? So once again, you can check the Bible readings on YouTube, uh, YouTube, on YouVersion, uh, and we'll be posting them on our Facebook page. Now, we find today in this first part of the story two lessons which I believe are very relevant for us to understand the story of the book of Esther. First is this. We will see that God is always at work, even when we don't see it. We just signed that a while ago, right? And the theme of the series, God behind the scene. And secondly, we'll see that although the world is obsessed with appearances, God is not. Okay? So those are the two things we want to talk about. But before we do that, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the story of Esther, let's do a quick uh, view or overview of the story, okay? Now, chapter 1 begins with the king, King Xerxes, or in other translation, uh, King Ahasuerus, okay? He's, he's in the Persia, uh, he's in Susa, right? And he has this great banquet. Actually, he has two banquets. The first one was a 180-day banquet, and the second was a seven. Seven for seven days, okay? Now, if you didn't get that, 180 days is how many months? That's six months, okay? Six months banquet. That's really extravagant by 
any standards. Now, during the banquet, Circus gets drunk. Okay, and while he was intoxicated, he may have begun to brag about his beautiful queen. According to Jewish tradition, there was an argument among the men in the feast as to which country had the most beautiful women. And Circus, you know, wanted to de uh, decided to settle the issue by bringing in his wife or his queen. In chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, here's what it says. It says, On the seventh day, when King Circus was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, Mahuman, Bista, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zithar, and Carcass. I'm sure you don't want to name your kids with those names, right? <laughs> to bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. Now, let me just mention here that scholars have wrestled with the meaning of the command of the king here. The Talmud claims that she was to come wearing only her crown and nothing else, which would be what? Very scandalous, right? And even to ask the queen to do that. Now, we don't, of course, exactly know if that was the case or not. But for reasons that are unknown to us as well, the queen refuses, okay? And of course, that was a very brave thing to do because when you read later in the book uh, of Esther, you will find out that the king wields very, uh, with, with a lot of power. And for you to say no to the king, there would be consequences. And of course, we will read that the king was angry, probably because of the humiliation of being rejected by the queen. So he had a cabinet meeting, and it was decided that she would be stripped of her crown. Okay, so now we jump to chapter 2. In chapter 2, verse 1, it says, it says, Later, okay, later when the anger of the king, of king Circus had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. Now just some historical note here. Four years have passed. There's a four-year gap between chapter 1 and chapter 2. Okay, so it says, Later, no? So his anger over Vashi, Queen Vashi's refusal to obey him by this time have already subsided. And it now appears that the king, I think he's beginning to regret his decision for removing Vashti as queen. And, but he, he made a decree which he could not reverse. So the people around him, the advisors probably saw this happening. And so here's what they say. Come on, uh, king. We'll, we, we've got to find you a new queen, okay? So Esther chapter 2 verse 3 says, uh, the advisors tell him, let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful girls into the harem at the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let beauty treatments be given to them. By the way, the beauty treatments would take a year, okay? Now, the word girls there in other translations is rendered as young virgins, okay? And so they go out and find all the beautiful women, young virgins in the whole empire, and they bring them to Susa. Now, Josephus, the historian, tells us that it might have been as many as 400 women, some scholars even say it could have been a thousand of them who were brought to the king's harem. Now think about this. That's not actually impossible. Because when you read Esther chapter 1 verse 1 or verse 2, it says that Circus ruled over 127 provinces. So just take 10 from each province and that's easily more than a thousand women. Okay? Now the way it worked was this. Everyone who were brought in were to undergo beauty treatments, you know, all sorts of training, to get them ready for one thing. And what was that one thing? One night with the king. That's what it was all about. This was Miss Persia pageant. The winner gets a crown, and the only judge was the king, and the judgment would be based on what? That one night with him. You see the picture now? 
So everything hinges on what happens during that night because depending on the outcome, four things could happen to the girl uh, who, who uh, s- spends that night with him. One is that the king might not like her. So he would send her back to be his permanent concubine, but he never calls her back again. No? So she cannot go home. She cannot get married or have anybody else. So she's basically banished to permanent widowhood. Now, another way is that uh, second, probably the king might say, you know, I, I like this one. And so she becomes a concubine that he calls every so often when he feels like it. So that's a second uh, possibility. Now the third is this. If the girl is really, really lucky, she might be one of the two or three women that the king actually marries, and so their children will become heirs. Okay? And then the fourth is this. If the girl is the one that the king most favors, this girl will become the queen. Let me pause here for a moment, okay? I know some of you are already offended. <laughs> that, is, you know, that is revolting, right? I mean, the idea of just getting all of these virgins from all over the provinces and, and you know, just offends us. Many feminists would, would find this an affront, which they expect the author should have denounced. And as I've mentioned earlier, the author refrains from making any comment. Now, if you find that offensive, And I know some of you do, right? Let me point out to you a different side of this. Herodotus, the historian, also reports to us that 500 young boys would be gathered every year and they will be castrated to serve as eunuchs in the Persian court. Okay? Remember the eunuchs that we just read a while ago in the verses? 500 of them every year. Now, if you think about it, those young girls would have actually the better deal, right? Because whether the king likes them or not, they get to stay in the palace. But those boys, right? And this is the reality that the author wants us to know. That in the Persian court, the king wields enormous power and uses it blatantly for his own personal desires with little or no thought for the consequences of others. So, so much for the fairy tale version, okay? So let's continue. Now, we know that one of the girls would be Esther. Chapter 2, verse 8. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many girls were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. That's one of the eunuchs, right? Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. Now, the phrase was taken is in the passive tense, and Charles Swindoll uh, suggests that it could, have been, it could have met taken by force because that's how it's rendered in other places in the Old Testament. Karen Jobes in her um, commentary of Esther says, the passive voice is used frequently throughout the story suggesting that the characters are caught up in events by some unseen force that has ultimate control. So the very least, we can say that Esther went Reluctantly, very likely even forcibly, okay? Now, we don't know her age when this happens, but many scholars believe that she was in her teens, around 15 years old, not as much, not more than 20. Okay, let me just let that settle in for a moment. Okay, just think about that, okay? And her Jewish name was Hadassah, chapter 2, verse 7. Esther is her Persian name. Some believe that she was named after the Persian goddess of love, Ishtar. So that sounds like Esther. Uh, Jesenius, the Hebrew authority, also says, actually, that the name is derived from the word that means to hide. And so the name Esther could mean something hidden, which is very interesting because that's the theme of the book as well. Now, Esther, we know, was raised by his older cousin, Mordecai, because we are told that she became an orphan, okay? So when he took her, uh, when, when they took her, 
to, to the harem, Mordecai instructed her not to say anything about her Jewish identity. And, and so what happens, so while she was in the harem, nobody knew that she was Jewish. And so she went through all those beauty treatments and the trainings that was about a year, okay? And so when she went to the king, we are told in chapter 2, verse 17, now the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So that's the story so far. She becomes queen. Circus throws a, a marriage feast for Esther. So this orphaned Jewish girl in her teens becomes the queen of the greatest empire in the face of the earth at that time. Okay? That's the story so far. And it's told in a way by the author to teach us a couple of things. And today I want us to look at two things. The first is this. We need to understand when we read the book of Esther is that God is at work even when we don't see it. God is at work even when it doesn't look like he's there. God is there even when we don't see him. You see, I think many of you know this already. When you read the book of Esther, you won't find any mention of God in this book. In fact, it's the only book in the entire Bible where God is never mentioned. There's no religious reference of any sort. There's no reference to prayer, no reference to the Word of God, no reference to prophecy. And scholars note that. It's very clear. It's not there. God is not there in this book. Now, I read the story of a group of literature critics who, who gathered every month to read and analyze and you know, critique various works of literature, like poems like, and plays and short stories and the like. And in one of those sessions, they analyzed the literature of the Bible. And because they were liberal scholars and teachers, you know, they were greatly critical of the Bible. And it's not that the Bible was really bad literature, but it's, for them, it was not at par with many of the other great masterpieces of history. Now, when this group also, I mean, what this group also did was they also allowed personal works by others uh, to be given, and they would also critique them. And very few actually would dare do that because this group was, you know, they were scholars and they were very unkind in the way, in what they say. A few months just after they, uh, they critiqued the Bible, a young man submitted a short story to the group. It was a story of about 15 pages and the members of the club took the story home and they read it. And when they gathered again, the comments were amazing. Almost unanimously, they said that it was one of the finest short stories that was ever written. It had good character development. The plot was fascinating. The twists of events and reversals kept the reader on edge all the time. And there was foreshadowing of events, thrilling to follow. The heroes were lovable. The villains were, you know, detestable. In other words, it was, it was a great story. And so when they asked this young man how he thought of the story, he told them he didn't. To their amazement, he told them he pulled it out straight from the Bible, which they just previously critiqued to be being inferior literature. Now, he had just changed the names of the characters so that it would not be quickly recognizable as having come from the Bible. And what was the story? It was the story of Esther. You see, when you take the book of Esther out from the Bible, it can look just like any other piece of literature. A great piece of literature, by the way. Marion Taylor noted that the style of writing was like that of official Persian documents. So, but there's one thing that is very, very clear when you read the book of Esther. There is no mention of God at all. It's like the author deliberately avoids doing that. Uh, that can't really be an oversight. It's not like you know, the author said, oh, I, I actually forgot to put God in, right? Actually, it was deliberate because there are certain instances later on which you will see where the author deliberately just don't, doesn't say anything about God. And that means the author was making a point for us. You see, 
when you think about biblical history, when the people of uh, Israel were in trouble in the past, God sometimes would respond in extraordinary ways, right? Think about the ten plagues or, or the, the, the Red Sea parting during the time of Moses. Or, or the fire that consumes the altar when Elijah challenged the priest uh, of Baal, right? In those instances, God came through for the people in a magnificent way. But then, when you look at the book of Esther, it's not only that God is not mentioned, there's no miracle. There's no vision. There's no dream. Not, even, not a mention of any sort of God. God seems to be completely absent and silent in the book. But here's the thing. When you get to the end of the book, you will see that there's a whole string of coincidences that happen. And if they had not happened, all of the Jews would have been wiped out. And because one small thing after another happened, they were delivered. Let me, let me give you an example. Think about this. If the king had not gotten drunk and made that boast during the banquet, Vashti, Queen Vashti, would have remained what? She would have remained queen, right? But that's exactly the plan of God. Because if it had not happened, and the story goes without Esther becoming queen, she, she would not be in the position to save the Jewish people. Here's another thing. What if Esther was not pretty? <laughs> right? And even if she was pretty, remember, there was this a whole host of women, 1,400 to 1,000 of them. She, she bested all of them. How could that have happened? Here's another one. At the end of Esther chapter 2, we, we didn't read this, but you, you will read this within the week. Um, Mordecai hears about a plot to assassinate the king. He would tell Esther, who would by now have become queen. And what you will read is that even though the king knew that Mordecai had thwarted an, an assassination attempt, he forgot to honor him. And there was this one night, you will read that in chapter 6, when the king could not sleep. You know, and so he could not sleep, and he decides to, to open the record books and, and read, and, and read them. And he, he, it was read that Mordecai did this. And he, he realizes, wait a minute, I was not able to honor Mordecai for what he had done. And so what he did is he honored Mordecai then. Now, here's the thing. If the king did not forget and actually honored Mordecai right back when it actually happened, it would not have saved anybody. But the king honors him at a certain time which was crucial in the story. And you will find in this book coincidences after another, after another, and they're all ordinary things, just the sort of things that you would look at and you would not see them as anything that's miraculous. When you see, for example, the Red Sea parting, you know that's God, right? But when King Xerxes gets drunk and he declares and calls Vashti to parade in front of everybody, you don't say, wow, that's God at work, right? And the author is trying to tell us in this book that you and I must not make that mistake. Because he is telling us that God was at work. When he made that promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 that through his descendants, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed, God already knew. He already had in mind what he would do when the story of Esther happens. So if all those little coincidences had not occurred, if the king had not gotten drunk that night, the Jews would have been annihilated and wiped out of the map of the earth. There are no coincidences. It is God at work through the ordinary, and this is really, really important for us to understand. I think of my own personal experience. You know, when I was in my 20s, I never thought I'd become a pastor. Oh, I th some of you know this. I always said that, you know, pastor, it's a thankless job. And at that time, I wanted to know the will of God, but I understood. And 
my understanding was that the will of God would be very difficult to find out. And I had this idea that if you're going to be called to be a pastor, there has to be this fantastic way that God is going to make it known to you. But you know, when I look back, I realized that in my story, there were a string of incidents that happened that brought me to where I am today. Now, many of you know that I was in academia for more than 20 years. And you would have seen that that would be the career path that I would be taking for the rest of my life. But then one day, about more than a decade ago, there was this Chinese Bible study that was opened uh, in Banawa. And I was called by Pastor Mel. Uh, was it Pastor Mel or Sister Marie? And she invited me to join the Bible study. You know, I think my wife knows this. I reluctantly joined. <laughs> Little did I know that I was going to be asked to handle the Bible study. First, I was just going to join it, and then I was going to handle it. That really escalated very quickly. Okay? And, and I could not say no because it was Pastor Mel who asked me, Nick, ikaw lang handle ani. And you know, and it turns out that there was another Chinese Bible study that was running parallel to ours, and we got to know each other, and we decided to open a Saturday service in Park Lane Hotel. And, you know, we had this whole string of pastors who were supposed to teach because it was a Saturday service, you know. Pastors preach on Sunday, so we'll have a lot of them who would come to preach every Saturday. Now, because I was one of the Bible study leaders, you know, and it was a fairly small congregation, 30, 40 people, I would preach occasionally when the real pastors were not available. But those pastors became unavailable so often, I had to preach more often. <laughs> Long story short, I eventually became a pastor. And who would have thought? Well, not me. But that was how God orchestrated things for me. There were incidents, small things that came one after another. You see, for many of us, here's what we think. We think that when God works in amazing ways, we see it. But when God works in the ordinary and in the mundane, we think He isn't there. But He is. Amen? When God is silent, it doesn't mean that He is absent. When God is hidden, it doesn't mean that He has abandoned us. He is working out His purposes and He's keeping His promises even when it looks like He is not there. So where are you today in your journey of faith? Are you discounting the significance of your ordinary days? Are you sighing instead of singing? And are you wondering what good will come out of this? All of these things that are happening to me today. If there's anything that you should remember from this story, it's this. Whether you see him or not, God is working. Amen? He specializes in turning the commonplace into the meaningful. Now, we know that God is sovereign over the events of governments and empires of the world, but he is also working in the midst of the usual, ordinary, regular days. God is at work even when we don't see it. Now, here's the second lesson. God doesn't care about externals. God doesn't care about appearances. Let's look over at the two chapters again. Now, in chapter 1, when you read chapter 1, it begins with a great banquet. How long was the banquet? 180 days, right? No wonder you know, Sirs got drunk. 180 days. And for six months, every kind of display of the majesty and the glory of Circus would be exhibited to, his, to the people, for the, from the, all of his slaves to the riches that he had. This was, it, it had all the ingredients of a pagan celebration, probably loud music, maybe wild dancing, a lot of drinking to excess. Here's how it's described in Esther chapter 1, verses 6 to 8. It says, it says, The garden had hangings of white and blue linen, fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were, there were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of, of, of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold, 
each one different from the other, and the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. But the king's command, by the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink in his own way, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. So can you imagine that party for six months? And scholars have actually observed the detailed descriptions that you will find in Esther chapter 1. It was really just a show of power. And then you jump to chapter 2. Here we have this international beauty pageant, right? A pooling together of all of these beautiful virgins from far and wide. It was the Persian version of the American Idol. And here we see the lavish excess of power of this one man named King Xerxes. And what the writer of the book of Esther is telling us is that in the Persian culture, the most important thing about the man was his wealth and his power. And the most important thing about a woman was her sexual and physical beauty. Now, aren't you glad that we don't live like that anymore? Yeah, right. No? Nah? We know the world has not changed. It's exactly the same. The world is sources, and it tells us externals, your image, appearances matter more than who you are. The color of your skin matters more than your character. What you have matters more than your integrity. Beauty, money, talent, power, connections, those things matter more than who you are. And therefore... You have to get all of these credentials unless you have the money, unless you have beauty, unless you have these kinds of resume, unless you get all of these, you're worthless. You have no value. Now, which brings me to the question, have we sold ourselves to the world system? Are we taking our own value and looking at other people's values based on externals? Are we looking at them, at the beauty, at the power, at the talent, and measure the value of people and ourselves from that in the way we choose our careers or our mates or our friends? What is really the driving value in our lives? And don't say right away, not me. Huh? You know, we, we can say that, we might say, I know people who are just like that, but not me. You know, truth is, we all are, to a certain degree. We are all affected by this world. And you know why we know that? Because of Esther. Let me just pause for a minute here. Let me ask you, here's something very important. How has Esther been doing so far? What do you think? If you just move away from the you know, romanticized Sunday school version of the story of Esther, what do you think of her record so far in the first two chapters. I'll tell you what. I've done a lot of readings, quite a number of commentators, both from the liberal side and the conservative side. And many of them will tell you that this first part of the story, in this first part of the story, Esther has blown it. She has sold out to the culture. She has given in. Here's what one Bible teacher said. Let me quote from you what he said. He said, I think we may safely assume that when the night was over, the young lady who was the king's date was no longer a virgin. Here's another one. I do want to point out, and I hope I do not confuse you by saying this, that Esther is sinning in this book. I don't want to excuse her completely. Now, even feminists, when they read the book of Esther, they are absolutely disgusted with her. You know, they love Queen Vashti because, you know, she stood up to the king. And, and she, she took the consequences. She was brave, they say. She, was, she has a voice, but not Esther. Now, by the way, don't count that in because there are many details, again, about Vashti that we do not know. Now, if you read, though, the entirety of chapter 2, you will see that Esther became queen by absolute conformity. She does exactly what Mordecai says to her, right? Don't tell them that you're a Jew. And she listened to Haggai, the eunuch who was in charge of all the other women in the harem, who most likely knew what the king wanted and did exactly what he told her to do. That's why, you know, the feminists are so angry at her because she just, she gave in to the system. She sold out. Now you're thinking, what about the evangelicals and the conservatives, the rabbis, when they read the book of Esther? What do they think? 
They also believe he failed, she failed. And here's why they think they, here's why they think that Esther failed. Remember when Daniel and his friends, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in Daniel chapter 1, right? If you are remember this, familiar with the story, they were brought into Babylon as slaves during their teens as well. They are much like Esther, Daniel chapter 1. But what happened in that story was they made it very clear that they would continue to follow Jewish dietary laws and not eat from the choice foods of the king's table. Remember that? What about Esther? Does she say anything? Does she object? You know, she could not have complained because remember, she kept it secret that she was a Jew. And what that means is that she would have broken all the Jewish dietary laws. She would have adopted Persian customs and ways to the extent that she was not recognizable as a Jew at all. And you know, some of you will say, well, it's just the dietary laws, right? But then again, we also know that she sleeps with a man that she was not married to, at least not yet. And then she marries an unbeliever. I'm saying that as candidly as I can. All of these things are violations of, the, of biblical law. And so as far as conservatives are concerned, Esther has sold out as well. Let me read to you what one commentator says. Karen Jobes in her commentary on, the, uh, on Esther. Here's what she says. The ambiguity of Esther's thoughts about her situation raises questions about her observance of God's law and her practices as a Jew. She was taken into the harem, gained favor with Haggai, the eunuch in charge, and received beauty treatment, special food, and seven servants. Notice what it says. Unlike Daniel and his friends, Esther does not protest because she could so successfully hide her identity as a Jew, she apparently had adopted Persian dress and customs at least to the extent that she was indistinguishable as a Jewish woman. And so both sides, liberals and, and conservatives, they, here's what they say about Esther. She's done terribly. She's given in to the system. And when you hear those words that I just said to you while just right now, how does that make you feel now about Esther? Now you'd probably say, yeah, I think she's guilty. I think she's failed. I think she's compromised. Right? Now, on the other hand, we could say, what could she do? I mean, yeah, what she did was wrong. She was guilty, but what could she do? She was probably forcibly taken. Maybe that's all that she could to keep herself alive. And so never mind the dietary laws and the sex, right? And you know, that, and that's exactly the point. Because, because you know what? We are really on the same boat. Here we are in, in a culture that's putting all this pressure on us. And there are times when you and I face situations where it's almost impossible to avoid failure. And in fact, just think about this. We're not even being challenged like Esther was. Amen? Let me give you an example. This one's for the young people. Uh, a lower, not so heavy example. <laughs> in my 10 years as pastor, more than 10 years, I've seen many young Christians who are looking for their lifetime partners. And you know how it's done, right? Let's just say there are 10 prospective mates, men or girls, okay? 10 prospective mates. And eight of them don't have much of the way of beauty or wealth or talent or, you know, the kinds of qualities that the world would admire and approve of. So what happens to these eight? You know, they don't have the looks. They don't have the wealth. They don't have the personality and all that. So what happens to them? People disregard them and avoid them. And they look at the other two, 
who have the qualities, the beauty, the wealth, and, and here's what they do. They hope like crazy that there's, there's some character and spiritual maturity in them, right? See, here's the thing. The first criteria that we use is the criteria of the world. And after that, Okay, so let's look at some Christian standards like maturity and in integrity, and, and let's hope they have some of it. And as a result, there's actually a lot of prospective, wonderful people that we just walk by. Whether you like it or not, here's the truth. The world is affecting us much more than we care to admit. And so once again, the question, are we guilty ourselves of selling to the world are we guilty just like Esther are we doing that to be honest yes to some degree or another we all are and, and I know there are some people some Christians here who have really done a bad job just like Esther she's got off to a horrible start she failed miserably and when you think of your own life you know you have made one mistake after another, after another, after another, and you just say, I am just tired of looking at my mistake. I am just tired of all the compromises that I have done. But here's the beauty of the story. By the end of the story, Esther is transformed. Because God works with her. God stays with her. God does not give up on her. And God turns her into something great. And here's what that means. That no matter how bad you have failed at the beginning of your life, no matter what wrong things, what wrong moves you have made in the past, God does not give up on you. Amen? Because you see, the story the message of the Bible is not God blesses and saves those who live moral and pure lives. If that's the way we see it, then we miss it totally, right? The message of the Bible is this. God consistently and continuously gives His grace to people who don't deserve it. He gives His grace to those who don't ask for it. He gives His grace to those who don't even fully appreciate it even after they get it. And you know what? We're just like that, amen? And that means in spite of the fact that you and I are polluted by the world, and if you're honest, you will admit that we are. But here's the thing. God does not give up on us. Amen. God does not give up. So if you are there today, you feel like you're an Esther, you feel like you have failed, remember this. God is the God of the unseen. In the mundane, in the ordinary, even our failures, He is there. Amen. You know, real beauty is different than what the world says it is. And oftentimes, you and I can't see it. A lot of times, we judge a book by its cover. Amen. We value ourselves and others by the standards of this world. And when the world, like King Circe says to you, I will be your spouse, but you have to be beautiful. You have to have this. You have to achieve this. You have to have all of these com competencies. And then and only then will I approve you. And we all buy into that. And here's the thing to remember. Every Christian must understand that you are not who the world says you are. You are who God says you are. Amen? It is time for us to get the real definition and beauty, the definition and beauty from God. Let God define who you are. Because ultimately, it is His acceptance that matters to us. Amen. So here's two lessons from these chapters. God is at work, even when we don't see it. Number two, God doesn't really care about the appearances and the externals. Amen. You know, earlier in the introduction, I told you 
that the story of Esther was written way after the events have occurred, right? And that means when the original readers read the story, they would have looked at it from a different set of lenses. Here's the thing. History tells us that Circes returned from Greece four years later after a great de defeat. He was defeated by, uh, in, in that battle. In fact, some historians say that you know, he took one to two million men into his ar of his army, and only about 5,000 of them returned. So Circes had to retreat home. He was defeated. He was in shame. And later on, Circes would be assassinated. Now think about this. Since the author of Esther was writing after the fact, right, he could have started his story by introducing Circes as the king who, who lost the Greeks, or as the king who was assassinated. But instead, when you read Esther chapter 1, chapter 2, you will see that he chose to introduce Circes as in his splendor, in the optimism of his, glory, of his glory days. But the effect to the original readers would have been like watching the Pacquiao match and saying, I feel the man to I know how it ends. And the, the author wants us to see the irony. Not just the irony, but the reversal of the king's fortune, which would have been known to the author and to the readers, which he would have been setting now the stage for another reversal in the story of Esther, which we're going to read in the next few weeks, and I hope you're looking forward to that, okay? Now, meanwhile, the simple point to remember today is this. Our God reigns. He's sovereign in all things. He's able to use even the weakest link in the chain of events so that His perfect will can be accomplished. Now, He's the God who never gives up on you. He's the God of the seen and the unseen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you. We worship you. We thank you. You are God. You are sovereign in all your ways. Nothing escapes you. Even the ordinary days that we live, you are there. And we thank you today that you remind us through the story of Esther that not only are you sovereign, but that you care. And that we can live our lives trusting in your perfect purposes and your will. And I pray, Father, that for all of us who are here, we will, we will find renewed strength. We will find renewed faith and encouragement from your word today. God, allow your Holy Spirit to just continue to speak to us in the coming days, in the coming weeks. So that whatever we face, Lord, we will remember that you are the God of the seen and the unseen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.